All right, so what they say is that if a head and shoulders pattern, if the price goes above the neckline, effectively the head and shoulders gets uh, invalidated. So the head and shoulders now theoretically is actually no longer in play on Bitcoin. We bounced off this 200 week moving average, which is a very, very, very positive sign. And then they say even further, okay, even further they say, if you invalidate a pattern, then the move to the opposite direction tends to perform better than the move that what that should have happened had the pattern actually happened now you will remember that we said that if this head and shoulders actually happened we would go down from the top of the head down to the neckline which was four thousand one hundred and fifty nine dollars and from the point where you break down below, below the neckline you go down four thousand one hundred and fifty dollars now that was supposed to take us to about twenty three thousand two hundred but since that pattern's broken, and since a pattern tends to be more aggressive if it does get broken, we've got to ask ourselves a question. Where is Bitcoin going? And why is it going there? And the reason why I say that is because there's actually no real reason for the market to be bullish. If you look at the PCE numbers that came out on Friday, not bullish. Inflation is back. As a result, Powell's probably going to increase interest rates. So they're not going up because of the macroeconomic events. Then people will say to you, well, you know what? The reason why the numbers are going up is because of the debt ceiling. This debt ceiling is an absolute, absolute, absolute disaster for crypto in any liquid markets. So what is it that's actually causing the markets to go up? What is it that's actually causing Bitcoin to go up? How is it that even though these things are happening and these macro things are very, very big, why are the bubbles green? That's what we're going to be talking about today, because I think we've got to dig really deep here to find out exactly what's going on. So let's do this. All right, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. Josh, do me a favor. Just run to Wendy and ask her if there's definitely no almond milk in this. My throat feels a bit itchy after drinking this. And I am allergic to almonds. That, that's not a good thing. All right, so listen, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Nice to have everyone back here on Memorial Day. And nice that Memorial Day is actually a green day. As you can see on the bubbles, we have invalidated this head and shoulders, as you can see. And I, th I wonder if Burb is right. I mean, that would take it $4,150 above where we are today, which could get us as high as... Uh, it could take us as high as about 31,000, 32,000. If it does get over 31 or 32,000, you know what everybody says, you know, that's that's the point where even Gareth Soloway has to become a bull. That's the point where even Gareth Soloway becomes a bull. So listen, if you're new to the channel, welcome, welcome, welcome. If you, if you are here and you're a regular, smash the like button, obliterate the like button. I see that our likes are only at 225. Let's get them up. Let's get them up. Let's let's tell the algorithm that we're here even on Memorial Day. Let's tell the algorithm that everything's going well, that this is good content. As Ivan says, obliterate it. Let's get the momentum going. Um, lots to talk about today because I really want to decode why Bitcoin is actually going up. And I think I have the reason why Bitcoin is going up, even though we have a disaster of PCE numbers. We have a disaster of a debt ceiling deal. Everybody's celebrating a debt ceiling deal. I'm going to show you today why the debt ceiling deal is really, really bad for crypto. Um, a lot of people are saying that it could be because of China. It's not because of China. And I'm going to show you today why it's not because of China and how you have got to be smarter than everyone else when it comes to this China pump. Because there are a lot of Chinese coins that are pumping, but they should not be pumping. And a lot of people are going to try and get you into these China coins saying, well, it's a China narrative, it's a China narrative, it's a China narrative. Let's look today and understand what this China narrative actually means. Because come the 1st of June, it could be a sell the news type scenario, or it could be a buy the news type scenario, but you've got to know exactly what to buy. So we're going to talk about that. Um, yeah, and I think I'm going to show you what I think it is that is actually causing this pump. Okay, so it could be, I mean, it could be what Don says. He says it is a bunch of short squeezes. I think he's right. I've looked at this data. There are a bunch of short squeezes that happen. Every time these short squeezes happen, it pushes the market down. So you had one over here, push the market down, <clears throat> push the market up. You had a short squeeze here, push the market up. 
another short squeeze here. And you see just a series of these short squeezes pushing the market up, which pushed the market up all the way from 27,000, actually even before, all the way to where Bitcoin is today, which is, I don't know, probably just under 28,000. So that's the first thing. And actually what I'm watching, to be honest, I know why I've become like a cheerleader here. I want to see if we can get five green months in a row. So we have at the moment, as you can see, we have a green month in January. We have a green month in Feb. We have a green month in March, a green month in April. And we're only 4.55% below having a green month. Man, man, da, da. Let's try it again. A green month in May. So if you, yeah, if you believe we are going to get a green month in May, smash the like button. Let me know what, let me know what you think. Uh, we're also going to go through the altcoins. Quick thing, let's just quickly go through the altcoins. Injective, 762. Uh, the reason for that is they launched the mainnet, I think, yesterday or launching their mainnet yesterday. Lots of alpha in the bubbles, by the way, if you haven't already been there today. BSV up on, on a narrative which we're going to talk about today. Um, how am I doing in the trading competition if BSV is up? Because I was... No, come on, that can't be right. That can't be right. Am I still, am I still down so much? It's that suey position. It's that bloody suey position. Got me. Um, I also want to prove the naysayers wrong. You know, everyone that said sell in May, go away, sell in May, sell in May. I want to just prove to them that selling in May actually isn't right because the data showed us that the selling in May actually wasn't right. So we're going to unpack everything today. Got a big show, even though it is Memorial Day. Um, we don't take Memorial Day here in South Africa. We here, we bring you crypto love and crypto wisdom. The lights may go out because we have this thing called load shedding, which is where they basically switch off our electricity um, to try and save electricity. So if they do, just bear with us. We'll get, we'll get back uh, immediately. Um, all right, so let's go. Let's look at what, so Bitcoin moving up. We said that. And it's moving up, I think, against what should be happening. Why? Because we had inflation. Inflation numbers for the first time in like five or six readings actually went up. So before the previous inflation numbers, and we're talking about PCE inflation, which by the way is the inflation measure that the Fed uses when talking about inflation. They don't talk about CPI like we talk about CPI, they talk about PCE. So the previous inflation reading, 4.2%, we got 4.4%, the forecast was 3.9%. Not good. What did that do? Well, it basically, I would say cemented the fact that the Fed is going to increase interest rates at the next meeting. I think that's pretty much a given right now, no matter who you are, you're probably saying that. You can see that even, I always say that these guys are, are very, very, very optimistic. They also now forecasting an increase in interest rates in, in the June meeting, no increase in July, no increase in August, and then a reduction in November and December, in November and no move in December. I'm willing to almost guarantee that unless something breaks, and I really can't see anything breaking that quickly, we don't get any rate drops this year. I think as Powell says, it's going to be rates higher for longer. So that's not good for Bitcoin. So if it's not good, if, if, if there are rates that are higher for longer, why is the market going up? So then you get another bunch of people that are saying, look, the reason why the market's going up is because of the debt ceiling, because the markets were so worried about this debt ceiling crisis that right now that they've got this potential deal on the debt ceiling. And I say it's a potential deal because they have reached agreement, but remember, there's still a vote, and the vote happens on Wednesday, okay? It is Wednesday, yeah? Vote, vote happens on Wednesday. So the vote happens on Wednesday to pass the final debt ceiling deal. Now, it seems to me like it's exactly what we expected. Sorry, what was the almond milk in it? Yes. Amazing. Okay, well, we'll just hope. Uh, it's fine. I'm, a, I'll, I'm fine for now, I think. Um, I'm allergic to almonds and these geniuses put almond milk in my, in my drink and I could feel it immediately. So if I start swelling and that, we'll all know it's fine. It's fine. I'm all good. I'm all good. If, if I feel it, I'll have to start the show. Um, <clears throat> okay. There's nothing like knowing that you've drunk almonds and you're allergic to almonds um, <laughs> to, to get you all worried about the fact that you just drank almond milk. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You see, my, my, ama my amazing team's got me an EpiPen in case, in case it's the end of my life. Mm. Let me drink some water. I should be fine. If I do start swelling, we'll have to end the show. Um, okay, so there is a debt deal on the table. It's a crazy debt deal. It's the first time that I've seen a debt deal where they don't actually talk about amounts. 
what they talk about is they talk about a time period. Like I said, usually debt deals say, okay, look, we'll increase the debt deal by, by the, the debt ceiling by $2 trillion or by $1 trillion. But this one didn't. This one said, we will increase the debt ceiling for two years or by two years. That's it. And they're saying in those two years, we'll have spending cuts of $50 billion. Now you're talking about $50 billion in about $4 billion of additional spend that's going to happen. They clawed back $10 billion of the new IRS funding, which they gave. No budget caps after 2025. And that shows that what they're basically saying is they're saying that um, um, by 2025, the new government would have come in. And by that time, they'll have to renegotiate as part of the new government. Uh, boost in defense spending, which we kind of know about. Domestic program spending frozen for one year. It sounds like a bad deal for both sides, which actually means it's a good deal. So you, you had Biden coming out. This is what Biden said. I uh, just spoke with Speaker McCarthy, and we've reached a bipartisan budget agreement that we're ready to move to the full Congress. And I think it's a really important step forward, excuse me. <clears throat> and it takes uh, the threat of catastrophic default off the table, protects our hard-earned and historic economic recovery, and the agreement also represents a compromise, which means no one got everything they want. But that's the responsibility of governing. And the, this is a deal is good news, for, I believe, you'll see, for the American people. The agreement prevents the worst possible crisis, a default for the first time in our nation's history. An economic recession, retirement accounts devastated, millions of jobs lost. It also protects key priorities and accomplishments and values that congressional Democrats and I have fought long for, long and hard for. Investing in America's agenda that's creating good jobs and communities throughout the country. It protects Social Security, Medicare, and veterans, and so much more. The Speaker and I made clear from the start that the only way forward was a bipartisan agreement. That agreement now goes to the United States House and to the Senate. I strongly urge both, both chambers to pass that agreement. Let's keep moving forward on meeting our obligations and building the strongest economy in the history of the world. I'll take so a few- So Elon, Elon is skeptical that this deal is going to get passed on the vote. I don't know if it's not going to get passed, but it does feel like um, it's not- a deal that everybody liked. I mean, listen to this to this uh, segment from CN, CN, CNN. Um, in your caucus, uh, Congressman Ken Buck called this a deal a debt ceiling surrender. Congressman Ralph Norman said it was insanity. Congressman Bob Good uh, tweeted that no one claiming to be a conservative could justify a yes vote. Their basic criticism uh, is that McCarthy gave up too much and could have uh, could have. Uh, gotten more. What, what, how do you say, what do you say to that? Well, I, I'm the head of a, a group of 75 pragmatic conservatives called the Main Street Caucus. And so when we say conservatives are against it, I want to make it clear, uh, I don't know a single one of the mainstream caucus House conservatives. Freedom caucus conservatives. Uh, uh, well, and say. even some of them, I listen, there will be Freedom Caucus people who vote for this package. So when you're saying that conservatives have concerns, it is really uh, the most colorful conservatives. Some of those guys you mentioned didn't vote for the thing when it was uh, kind of a republic. So it just feels like, if I look at this, it just feels like everyone here is unhappy. The, the public seem to think that we've got a $50 billion spending cut in an exchange where they're raising the debt ceiling by $4 trillion. Now you heard that right. They're raising the debt ceiling by $4 trillion at least in the next two years. Um, and that is, I mean, if you look at the, the debt ceiling, $31.8 trillion. They reckon by 2025, when this, this debt ceiling deal is finished, this number is going to be on $36 trillion. So all they negotiated this whole time was they're negotiating spending cuts of $50 billion. Okay, they finally, finally, finally get, get the deal done. The Republicans aren't happy. Democrats aren't happy. Public seems to be unhappy. And it's now what I think not going to be a good scenario for crypto and and um, and risk assets, and I'm going to explain to you why that happens. I think right now the markets are celebrating, and the, the markets are celebrating that there is some kind of debt deal. So everyone's going, well, well, congratulations, there's a debt deal. We were so worried the U.S. would default. I think the reality is that no self-respecting individual, and no self-respecting economist, and no self-respecting market commentator ever thought that the U.S. would default. We kept saying to you that the U.S 
was never going to default and that this was a campaigning game between the Democrats and the Republicans to sling mud at one another and to show each other up and to almost make the other one look less popular. Sorry, my throat's a little bit... <clears throat> Forgive me. Um, so it does feel like like this whole thing was for for a saving of $50 billion makes it ap absolutely ridiculous, especially when you're talking about a game or, or raising the debt ceiling by $4 trillion. Now, here is where it gets ugly. Remember that last week we showed you, we kept showing you this chart. This chart shows the Treasury's account. It's called the, the TGA, which is a Treasury General Account Balance. And this is effectively the amount of money that the Treasury has in its account. Now, if you look at how much money they have in their account, they have, is that right? 49.47 million. Is that, is, that, is that the right number? 49.47 million. I think it's either that. I mean, it's got to be that. $49 million. That's correct. Not 49 billion. 49 million. Forty-nine. They have $49 million left in their account. So what's the first thing that the Treasury are going to have to do to increase this account so that they actually have money to spend? Imagine this being the Treasury's bank account with their bank, which I think is the Fed, right? So where, where would this um uh, uh it's 49 billion just it's 40 it's 49 billion but where wh what are they going to do how are they going to fill up this 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 account well what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to sell treasuries into the market and this is where the market is reading this all wrong i said i think what's going on here is the market is celebrating a debt deal when they should be concerned about how the treasury is going to be re refilling its account because how they fill their account is very simple they go to the market and they say, would you like to buy our debt? And they issue more of these T-bills and they say, hey, would you, hey, Joe, hey, J hey, Josh, hey, Ferdy, would you like to buy our T-bills so we can have money to put into our account and you can have more of our debt? What does that do? It does two things. The first thing that it does is it increases, it takes money out of the market because all the money in the market now has to be paid to the treasury so that the treasury can top up their account. The only thing is that the treasury top up their account and it takes them a long time to spend the money. So what they do is they take money out of the economy for a while until they actually spend it and it hits the economy again. The second thing that it, that does talks to this chart over here. So let's look at this chart over here. And if you look at this chart over here, you will see the Dixie has been creeping up. So look at the dollar, the dollar index. The dollar index is now back at 104.26. At the lows, this dollar index was touching one or 101. So why is that? Because the market is forecasting that people are going to need to buy treasury bills. How do they buy treasury bills? So that, how do they buy these treasury bills? Well, they need US dollars. And so what they think is they think that the, the, the treasury may actually raise up to $1 trillion by selling these T-bills. And when they do that, they will take liquidity out of the market. And you know that Bitcoin is a function of liquidity. And if Bitcoin is a function of liquidity and you're taking $1 trillion out of the market, hard to believe that Bitcoin is moving up. We also know that the NASDAQ is a function of liquidity. Let's quickly look at, at the NASDAQ, which is the US tech stocks. If you look at the NASDAQ, and you look at the US tech stocks, look at where the NASDAQ is relative to where it was at its lows. It is, it's rallying now, and it has bounced about 40% off its lows. These are, 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 are markets that should respond to liquidity. And this is what, what this Mickey, Mick, Mikey Bull says. He says, liquidity is the core factor of the market and Bitcoin remains very sensitive to the condition of liquidity, Raising the debt ceiling is a negative for liquidity. If the Fed undertakes to rebuild the Treasury General account, I can't imagine that they're not going to rebuild this account. Otherwise, how are they going to spend? So what happens now? A similar event happened in 2011 to 2013. What happened in 2011 to 2013? Well, for one, I, I looked it up. And in 2011 to 2013, the Fed didn't replenish its, its uh, general account as quickly as it did. Also in 2011 to 2013, what we saw was, hold on, I'm going to find this for you, this. We saw gold rallying. We saw the bonds rallying, the 30-year bond rallying. Why did the bonds rally? Because 
more people were buying this government debt and therefore obviously forcing up the price. You've got gold rallying because people want to be in a safe haven because they now realize that governments can actually default. So that's what happened in 2011. Now, if the same thing happens again now, then we will get liquidity taken out of the market and we could get a gold rally. We could get a gold rally. And this is where it gets interesting because this, this could be one of the reasons why um, Bitcoin is actually running. Because they may be looking at Bitcoin and saying, hold on a second. Bitcoin may perform like gold performed in 2011. And in 2011, gold performed extremely well. And now look at the correlation between Bitcoin and gold. So you look at the correlation between Bitcoin and gold and you can see that Bitcoin is much more co or has, the in has an increase in its correlation with gold. That's the first thing that can happen. But a lot of, a lot of um, uh, commentators are now looking at this and going, look, you know, the smart minds are going, when the debt ceiling is inevitably raised, the main driver of US, of US net liquidity will be quantitative tightening, which points to lower liquidity through the middle of the year, which would place downward pressure on Bitcoin. So the reason why the markets are moving is not related to the PCE numbers. And it's certainly, certainly, certainly not related to the debt ceiling, because these are two, in my mind, net negatives for Bitcoin and crypto. Okay. So now you get another bunch of people. And what they're saying is the reason why the markets are running is because of China. They are saying that, and by the way, I think all these views are wrong. I'm going to show you one by one by one. I'm going to debunk every single one of these views. They're saying that on the 1st of June, Chinese trading is going to open up and that is going to bring a whole lot of new liquidity into crypto on the 1st of June. You've heard that everywhere. You've even heard that on our channel. But then... You dig a little deeper and you say, okay, let's eliminate the noise. Let's, let, let's for one second just eliminate the noise and let's take a rational view about this China opening up its liquidity. Now, there's been a lot of hype. There's been the Chinese white paper. There's China uh, 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 hiring blockchain technologists. There is China investing in a metaverse and really all the, the narratives that the Western media can squeeze out of the very, very, very blocked off China community, right? So let's look at what the reality is. The reality is here, they're saying that Hong Kong Commission, so it's not China, it's Hong Kong, crypto trading will be allowed, allowed for retail starting on June, 20, on June 1st, 2023, which is on Thursday. But if you look a little bit deeper, what it says is Hong Kong security is regulated to accept license applications for crypto exchanges starting June 1, 2023. Which means that they're not, everyone's not gonna all of a sudden start trading. What it says is the securities regulator will accept license applications. That does not mean that you're gonna get an inflow of money on the 1st of June. And there are a whole lot of requirements if you want a license. It talks about liquidity, it talks about Main, uh, crypto exchanges to maintain at all times no less than five million Hong Kong dollars or six hundred forty thousand dollars in capital at the end of each month to submit the platform's available and required liquid capital as a summary of bank loan advances, and so the list goes on and on and on of all these things that they have to pass. So it's not like all of a sudden you're going to get these massive pumps um, happening. And right now I was doing some research. The only exchanges that I can find that have either submitted or approved are has Key Pro and OSL because they are Hong Kong partnerships and they have partnerships with local securities brokers in Hong Kong. And I also saw something about Huobi doing that. So I think Huobi announced today that, th that did they announce they've got a license or that they've applied for a license? Uh, Send me the tweet. Let, let's look at the tweet. I think Huobi have also applied for a license. So why am I saying this to you? Because there are a lot of people that are pumping this China narrative. And they are saying that on the 1st of, of June, all of a sudden, trading is going to become legal and everybody's going to start trading. You're smarter than that. It's, and that's not what's going on here. What's going on here is on the 1st of June, applications will open and it will take time for those applications to be approved. And once those applications are approved, it'll take time for the money to start flowing in. So yes, I'm extremely bullish about China, but I, I don't want our community to get caught in, in this hole, in, in this garbage of, of, of the hype. And I want to show you something even further. In order for, um, for tr virtual trading platforms, they've got to have 12-month track records, 
for the actual coins, there's got to be two. In, they're got to be part of two independent indices. Now you look at the indices. Here are the tokens that can actually be traded. Okay, what are they? Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, Polkadot, Solana, Cardano, Avalanche, Polygon, Chainlink, uh, EOS, um, and you can see a couple of your. You can see a couple of your um, uh, uh, um, uh, tokens over here. Now, you have probably been watching a lot of channels, and even on our channel before we did the proper research, which told you that there's a whole lot of Chinese coins that are actually starting to rally. Things like Conflux, things like NEO, things like all of those that are all of a sudden miraculously going to rise on the 1st of June when the ban is lifted. Okay, they're not going to. Or they are going to, but if they are, they're going to do it for the wrong reason. They're not going to do it because the Chinese are all rushing to buy them. Because right now, if you're betting your money on this Hong Kong um, uh, opening up, these are the only tokens that are in theory legal to trade and they're only legal to trade when the exchanges have the, the authorization once they have the crypto approval. Now, I just want to show you something. So let me just show you something. Big news. Huobi offers crypto trading in Hong Kong to retail institutional clients. Huobi said it applied for a regulated crypto exchange license in Hong Kong. Having applied for a license, it is now offering spot trading to retail institutional clients in the region. So they only applied today. So be careful. Be careful, be careful, be careful. Be careful that you're not going to get into a situation where A, you're, you think that there's a lot of money coming in, and B, that you start buying all these small cap Chinese stocks because you think that these narratives are going to play out. Most of these tokens actually aren't even um, aren't even approved. Now, one of our analysts said this morning, he says, you know what, so what? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter here um, uh, that they haven't been approved. It's the sentiment that China is getting back into the game. And you know what, he may be right, and it just depends what you want to be trading. If you want to be trading sentiment, that's one thing. But if you want to be trading real facts and fundamentals, that's another thing. I'm not saying that they're both not going to run. Both are going to run because that's just the way that it works. Okay, um, uh, but make sure that you know what you're trading. If you're trading Chinese coins like Conflux and Neo and whatever else, just make sure you know that you're doing it because you're trying to capitalize on hype and you're not really trying to capitalize on tokens that are being bought because the tokens that are being bought are these tokens over here, if any, and only when the licenses actually get approved. So keep your eye on that. We will keep you updating, updated. Someone says to me here, um, Okay, so we one of our sponsors is actually now creating. So they remember GNS is a is a decentralized platform. They've got a, a international support feature which allows you to view G Trade platform and trading UI in your preferred language. I guess what they're talking here is to start doing it in Chinese. And here we go, Chinese, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's it. I wanted to warn you. I wanted to warn you about that. That that isn't the reason why Bitcoin should be pumping. Yes, it's positive, but we're not all of a sudden on the 1st of June going to get a billion dollars or a trillion dollars or whatever it is flowing into Bitcoin and pumping up the price. It's a process. We've got to follow that process. We're going to look at the exchanges that get approval. We're going to look at when they get approval. We're going to look at the tokens. And that's how we're going to trade this. We're going to trade this with fundamentals. So it's not the debt ceiling deal. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, it's not the debt ceiling deal, which is pumping up the price. It's not the interest rate, it's not the US inflation which is pumping up the price. It's something else. It's something that a lot of people have missed. And it comes from one of the biggest supporting countries in Asia of crypto. And I want to show you this. It's not coming from the US, and I'll show you in a second how I know it's not coming from the US. But I want you guys to see this because I think this is where the, the clue lies, okay? or one of the clues, because I'm going to show you a couple of reasons why this market's running. First reason is, look at the Nikkei. Nikkei is at all-time highs. This is the Japanese stock exchange. The Japanese stock exchange is now at all-time highs. Why is the Japanese stock exchange at all-time highs? Very simple. Because of liquidity, okay? Japanese liquidity is going up because the Japanese government is putting money into the market and they are defending the yen, and to do so, to defend their economy, they are putting liquidity into the market. Now, I did a little bit of digging earlier today, and I saw that the, the Nikkei, which is the Japanese stock market, all-time high. Okay, cool. 
Best performing developed equity market so far this year, especially versus the US. So you can see that if you look at this green line over here, this is Japan. Now, while we're all focused on, on the um, uh, uh, US and Europe, Japan, which is this big economic powerhouse, is actually outperforming everyone. And why are they outperforming? Because of liquidity, because they're putting more money into the market. Now, what happens to Bitcoin when you put more money into the market? And you can see this when you look at global liquidity. You may remember, I used to show those global, Ferdy, can you see me the global liquidity chart? So you can see just how the, the bank, how important the Bank of Japan is. But what you can see is, you can see that if there's one thing that Bitcoin loves, it's a Nikkei breakout. Every time the Nikkei breaks out, every time that Japan is positive, every time the Nikkei has a breakout, the Japanese index, Bitcoin has a run. It is tested, you can test it and test it and test it. Go back to 2010, every single time that the Nikkei has had a breakout, the, 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 the uh, Bitcoin has had a run. And we're witnessing it now again. Again, I show you. Here is the Nikkei hitting all-time highs, completely nine price discovery, broken all resistances. Here is the Japanese liquidity that is actually driving this Nikkei to go up. And here are the results. Look at Bitcoin versus the Nikkei in the long term. Literally, if you break it down, just, just have a look at that. And we're going all the way back to when Bitcoin started. And you can see every single time that you've got Bitcoin going up, 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 all these big things all correspond to Nikkei. Now, why, why am I telling this? Because it seems to me like there has been, we have almost had this, 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 this player in Bitcoin, which is one of the original players in Bitcoin, one of the big players in Bitcoin and in Asia. And we've all kind of not really watched it. We kind of have not really watched it. And now that you actually remove all the noise and you say, look, the US isn't bullish. The, they're about to increase interest rates again and to go into quantitative tightening. They did a debt ceiling deal, which is actually going to drain liquidity out of the market. When you look at uh, um, the, uh, you look at China, you say, okay, China is going to come into the market, but not yet, not yet, not quite yet. You go, hold on a second. It's coming from Japan. The money, the money is coming from Japan. Ferdy, did you send me the, the chart of liquidity? Okay, so he's going to send me the chart of liquidity, and I'm going to show you the liquidity, that this liquidity is actually coming from Japan. And so what we should be doing, we should be spending more time looking at what Japan is doing and correlate or, or show Japan versus the rest of the world. And hopefully in a few minutes, I'll be able to show you that chart. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and we can take it from there. So that is, I think, why the markets are going up, when they shouldn't be going up. I think they're going up because Japan. We say it's because of China, it's not because of China. Maybe China's coming back, maybe not. I think, if I'm going to call a spade a spade, I'm going to be honest with you guys. I think this whole people digging this narrative of China are trying too hard. And I think that we're a long way away from a, from a, a real Chinese pump. I, don't think it, I think it might come. And I think China might actually take advantage of what the West is letting go of. And I want to show you some, somewhere else we're taking advantage of what the West has let go of, right? So you know that there's two real stable coins out there. This is a great, great, great indicator to show you the reality of what's happening in the crypto markets. There's two big stable coins out there, USDC and USDT. At the beginning of this year and beginning of last year, I came out and I said, USDC will obliterate USDT. At the time, why did I say it? because USDT's reserves were unchecked, unaudited, right? USDT's reserves were unchecked and unaudited. And USDC was this highly regulated company that everybody could trust in the US. Exactly, I said it, in the US. And it feels to me like people don't wanna have anything to do with tokens in the US. And so as a result, what we're actually seeing now is it's actually playing out in front of our eyes. You look at these two lines over here. The orange line here is USDC, USDC. And you can see that there was a point, there was a point where USDC was catching up on USDT. USDC, USDT collapsed and USDC was on the uptrend. Now, look at this. USDC has completely collapsed 
and USDT is on the uptrend. So let's just quickly work out a very, very, very quick ratio. At this point over here, the ratio of USDC to USDT was, let me get a calculator. So I'm going to take 66 divided by 55. So it was 1.2. So USDT was 20% bigger than USDC. And today, if I look at it, let's just look at the 83 billion versus the 29 billion. You're talking about 286% difference. Okay. What does that show you? Why are people moving out of USDC, which is the most regulated stable coin in the US, and moving to USDT, which is offshore, right? How, how do we get there? It is people moving out of the USA. You want to talk about how you want to talk about how crypto is getting destroyed in the United States. You want to show a couple of charts of how crypto is getting destroyed in the United States. Here's one chart that can show you exactly where people are moving to. Now, let me tell you what could happen next. And I'm not, I'm not saying it will happen. There's always been a lot of fad around USDT. And I don't think that USDT is ever going to collapse because if anything, they've proven that they're resilient as hell, probably the most resilient thing in the resilient stable coin in the world. Not only that, they showed the cracks in USDC's regulator strategy. Now, here's what could happen. I don't believe it will, but here's what could happen. Okay? What happens if, God forbid, but what happens if USD, USDT collapses? Something goes wrong with USDT and it collapses. Okay? It's going to be another one of those FTX moments where everyone goes to the SEC and says, where the hell were you regulating USDT? Where the hell were you? And so now you can see exactly that. People don't want to be. People don't want to be part of or involved in USDT, in USDC. They don't want to be in the USA anymore. I don't want to be in the USA. There was a point where all I wanted to do was be in the USA, and you could see that the ratio has changed. But hell, not anymore. Guys, there's nothing different between USDT and USDC. I mean, maybe where they store their reserves. One is regulated in the mother of all regulatory economies where it's completely safe and, and supervision uh, and oversight by, by SEC and whatever else. And the other one is, well, in the Bahamas or in Puerto Rico or wherever the hell they're domiciled. And where do consumers go? Well, they're going over here. Hold on, let's see. I think the guys are sending me some charts here. Let's quickly look at the, the US liquidity. No, not that one. I'm looking for the total liquidity of, of, of the world. Uh, okay, let's look at Japanese, but I want to see the total of the world showing Japanese liquidity. So there's Japanese liquidity, but I want to see like the, the, that shaded chart. You know what I'm talking about, the one with all the liquidity all around the world. You want to know why the Japanese stock markets are at all-time high? Because Japanese liquidity is at all-time high. Here we go. So you have Japanese stock market, all-time high. Now look at that chart, Japanese liquidity, all-time high. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Um, okay, cool. So that's that. Um, I mean, we, so let's talk about, about why the markets are going up. One is liquidity. Two, I have a theory. I have a theory. I might be right. I might be right, yeah. By the way, it, 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 this theory revolves around this guy actually being right. And when I said this guy actually being right, he, you know, this is the first time that I've actually seen a plot of the Bitcoin chart that I actually believe. And if this is right, we are getting to the point of disbelief now. So you can see that we've gone down from euphoria all the way down all the market cycles. We're now in disbelief. If we are in disbelief, what it means it is that there is disbelief by a lot of people that we are starting a new cycle. And in this cycle, I believe that there's going to be a new narrative. I said to you guys before that I was interviewed by Leia Halpern at the Bitcoin conference. She said to me, she said to me, she said, she asked me a question at the end of the interview. She stumped me. She said to me, so what do you think? She said to me, DeFi drove the first cycle. NFTs drove the second cycle, Metaverse. What do you think is going to drive the next cycle? Stumped. Thought about it for a while. Turned around and said, I think it's going to be Bitcoin. Because I think there's a new cycle beginning on Bitcoin. And that cycle is actually BRC20s and um, and 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 use cases on the Bitcoin network, right? 
And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing a new cycle. Now I want to show you some plays into this new cycle. First thing is, someone's seeing this because there's 30 new addresses with 1,000 plus Bitcoin created since May 4th. That, that's unprecedented in terms of growth. In terms of growth of Bitcoin whales, it's unprecedented that we get such an aggressive growth in such a short period of time for these wallets, for these whale wallets. It could be because of BRC20 activity and all of a sudden seeing that there is this new use case on Bitcoin. It could be just because people want to move away from, from, um, from, from governments and stuff like that. Either way, I do think that, there is, it is, that we are in the beginning of a, of a new market cycle. And I think this new market cycle is being led by Asia. And I think specifically being led by, by Japan. And I think in this market cycle, unfortunately, I think as important as the US is, it's not driving this cycle. And it's not going to drive this cycle until potentially the end of the cycle. Now, when I say the end of the cycle, I think when it comes to the elections, we're going to get um, a lot of campaigning around Bitcoin, around uh, altcoins, uh, around what, what is a security, what is not a security. And I think that that changes the game. And that's, what, that's basically what I think the new cycle is. So let's keep watching this chart. Let's keep watching the new addresses with a thousand plus Bitcoin. We'll keep an eye on it for you guys. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to do anything. In fact, all you need to do is like the content, subscribe, and that's all you need to do. Um, yeah, people are all, there's people here watching the glass here, making sure I'm alive. I'm alive. Don't worry. Everything's cool. I'm alive. I'm alive. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, I want to talk about one other thing. Uh, Ben.eth, please do me a favor. Put your hand up or tell me if you, if you sent money. I really want to try and understand who sent money to Ben.eth's new raise for loyal. L-O-Y-A-L. I really want to know where, where, if people send money to this. Now, I know some of you must have because dudes raised... 9,706 Ethereum since the 12th of May. This guy's killing it from these altcoins, from these meme coins, from doing nothing. He says, Ben, how many coins are enough? Do you even know what you're doing? He says, if I didn't have a plan uh, while doing all of this, none of it would have happened. Soon the hot ETH, we did speak about the fact that he's raised a lot of money. Now, I want to know in the comments, be honest with me, how many of you actually sent money to Ben.eth? I want to know about it. I want to know about it. Um, please don't. Please, 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 please don't. I think it's crazy if you, if you sent him. These things are going to pump, but they're all going to go to zero and it's going to be a big problem. Okay. And then, um, I mean, I did see this, which was quite cool. Hardware, hardware wallet Treasure says it sells sold 900% week on week after its competitor Ledger announced an opt-in feature for the recover. So that, that whole uh, 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 issue landed up costing them a lot of money. All right, quickly, let's talk about a few things. We are hiring. We need your help, guys. We need your help. We are hiring two to three roles in this business and we really need people. We're growing at a rapid pace and it's time we need you guys and we prefer to hire people from the community. So the first role that we have is a researcher role. What does a researcher do? If you are absolutely obsessed with crypto and you want to join us in helping us find the biggest stories, the biggest roles, the biggest narratives that are driving it and you want to be part of the inner circle that actually procures all the show information, we've got paid roles, unpaid roles, volunteer roles, part-time roles, full-time roles available. If you are this person obsessed with crypto with two years plus experience, go to research.recruits at cryptobanter.com. That's for this role over here. Then there's another role that we're hiring. So the first role is if you're a researcher and you want to just get involved in helping us spot narratives, um, get involved in helping us write. Is there a newsletter role separately? Okay, cool. So that's the first role. Second role. There's three roles we're hiring. So the th second role. We have a newsletter called Good Morning Crypto. There is a link to Good Morning Crypto before. Go and check it out. Okay, we are hiring someone to help us write this newsletter. So we had a writer. Our writer is leaving us. He's going to travel the world. And we're looking for someone to write. Now, we have some people on the team, but we want to see if we can find people from our community which are actually writers. Now, what you need to do, just go back to that, Josh. Let's go back to that. Okay, so only if you're an experienced writer and you're obsessed with crypto, what you need to do is you need to go and research Good Morning Crypto, the newsletter, of, there's a link below, and then you need to write, send us what your version of Good Morning Crypto would look like if you could do it your way. And maybe if you get it right, we will hire you and you can use our platform and build the Good Morning Crypto newsletter 
Uh, it's, I think it's a great opportunity. It's the first newsletter that comes out in the morning, I think, in most places around the world. It's called, called Good, Good Morning Crypto. You can do whatever you want. So if you think that you can write this better than our, the current writers, do it. And then let's see if you can send, send your version of uh, Good Morning Crypto to writers at CryptoBanter.com. And then the last position that we're hiring is we are growing. We have announced a partnership with Mario Norfolk and his team, and we are growing into Twitter spaces. And we need people that are going to help us book guests for Twitter spaces, for uh, banter. So if you seriously, seriously, seriously organized, if you've been in crypto for a while, if you know your way around crypto and you want to join a team helping us with all the guest bookings, that's the third one. It's called guest.relations at cryptobanter.com. Send us your CV uh, and we are hiring for those positions. And of course, we would prefer to hire from our community more than anywhere else. So listen, guys, I survived. Didn't have to use the EpiPen, even though I have an EpiPen here, just in case. Uh, but I think you need, we survived, a, we survived an almond attack. We survived almost being poisoned by employees in the office. We'll find out who it is. And we survived power cuts and we made it. And not only did we make it, but during the stream, what did Bitcoin do? Went up. I think we deserve, I think today we, we, we jumped through hurdles. We did like multiple things, multiple things to be here. So listen, I'll see you guys again tomorrow. Hopefully I'll be here tomorrow. Hopefully I won't have to use any of these pens. Until then, trade well, my friends.